Hi and welcome to this video for the BTEC Unit 4 Assignment 1. So this is a walkthrough for it. Now first thing to note is I said Assignment 1 but it's actually learning A and B. I do them in slightly different order. So just bear that in mind with whichever order you're doing them at your place. <clears throat> So, assign, uh, learning in B and C are pretty much identical in that the one of them just looks at an organic liquid and the other looks at the organic solid. So the organic liquid typically that you'll make is the ethyl ethanoate and the organic solid being aspirin, but I'll do that in another video. So there's two pass criteria for this. We've got P3 up here in this area and P4 down here. So for P3 it's pretty straightforward. You just need to carry out the practical, make the chemical and not kill anyone in the process. So it's testing that you can use the apparatus or so setting up reflux and distillation for making the ethyl ethanoate and then checking the boiling point of the distillate as it comes out from your uh, distillation column or sometimes you do the suolo boff method for determining the boiling point that way. Now the other little bit though just to get the P3 criteria as it says here you need to draw simple conclusions about the purity. So this can be something as straightforward as just saying the true boiling point is whatever degrees celsius mine was you know a different value obviously the true one you should look up a reference for that so you just go on google what is the true boiling point of ethyl ethanoate put a reference in your reference list for it and then obviously with yours it's extremely unlikely you'll get it identical if you do you will say my substance is fully pure if you don't, then simple comment, you just say you've got some impurities present. So nice and easy to get P3, no real excuse for missing that. Now with P4, this one requires you to get on Google and more or less just start hammering in through the searches to figure out, well, to find out rather four different things. So the four things, scale, equipment, testing, and raw materials required to make the ethyl ethanoate. So if you just type in ethyl ethanoate production, straight away you'll see some of the industrial websites appear from the chemical engineering sectors that manufacture this. Even if you click on images, you'll see some of the flow charts of the machinery setup that they've got. So the raw materials are what chemicals they use initially to make it. There's different methods. You've kind of got the Fischer esterification method. You've got the Tischchenko, if my pronunciation of that is reasonable, method of doing that, which is the more favorable these days. Uh, so look up the chemicals involved in those. Equipment, it usually helps to look at those images, what I was saying, the flow chart, and with the pictures, they'll have it listed, kind of the uh, order that it goes through the machinery in terms of if there's reactor vessels, distillation columns and such in there. The scale is just how much is produced. Now, you'll typically find values for that annually. Uh, it may either be in the UK, the US, or globally, as long as you've done a little bit of research and to find out roughly how much. Basically, to see that it's a big number. So these chemicals are quite important. You'll be looking at the hundreds or thousands of tons of this material made per year. And then the final bit is how they test the purity. So this will be an instrumental technique. So it will not be boiling point measurement that they use in industry. There's bits further up that will come on to, to say boiling point isn't particularly very good. It's just really quick and easy for students to use in college. So you'll be finding things 
of the instrumental type, whether it's mass spec, GC, so gas chromatography, HPLC. Some companies use one or the other, depends on how big the company is. Now, the other little bit at the bottom here, all references must be acknowledged. So you're doing research on these four things, five if you include the boiling point so far, you should have a reference for each of them. If you don't, straight away your P4 is going to be knocked back because as it says, should be acknowledged in there. Now the merit bit, two parts in that. So we've got M2 and M3 in here. M2, pretty straightforward. Uh, being able to carry out the practical well, essentially. So independently assemble, uh, no strain on the equipment. So when you've been setting up the distillation, the glassware looks safe to the teacher. They'll be doing an observation report for that. So you've not smashed anything, or if it was a small test tube, maybe just one th small thing, but you've cleaned it up. And then you've got the chemical with a roughly close to pure boiling point at the end. <clears throat> now the other bit is it says learners will draw detailed conclusions about the purity of their samples and provide explanations based on the principles behind the techniques to support their conclusions. So you did a boiling point analysis for testing the purity. So you need to say, obviously you will likely have impurities present. You need to look at whether or not your boiling point is above or below the true value because there's a slightly different explanation for which way it goes. So above is the most standard way of a, an impurity does raise boiling point. It's why you put table salt into a pan of water so you can boil it to a higher temperature. Or sometimes you may get a boiling point that's a little bit lower. You might have an azeotrope formed with a different chemical and that can slightly lower the boiling point with it. So it depends on yours which style you're going to be tackling that with. But that's needed in there for the M2 along with your observation report. Now M3, if you've done P4 well, shouldn't be too much of a stretch. What we need is a little table of more or less an industry. Versus in the lab, kind of what chemicals you've used and then what equipment, how they test the purity and the scale, what we said earlier. So we need a brief statement of for example, what equipment they use in industry, what equipment they use in the lab. But then you also need to go into the principles behind each. So, for example, you would say the principle behind distillation and that it separates substances according to their boiling point. So the one with a lower boiling point evaporates into a vapor first, rises up, goes to the condenser column, cools down, condenses to a liquid, and is therefore separated out from the other chemicals. So it's one way of getting your product and trying to purify it by separating it from the others. Have a look at what equipment they use in industry when you've done your P4 research. Tell me the principle that it operates on. It might be similar, it might be different, and that's all you'll round it off with, whether, say whether or not it's similar or different. Likewise, the testing, fairly straightforward in there. So you've done the testing with boiling point measurement. In industry, again, it will be different. Tell me the principle roughly behind the instrument that's being used in industry and you're going to definitely be saying it's different there. Now for D2, so D2 looking at yield and purity. Those are the key things to focus on. We need a couple of factors for how the uh, various steps within the practical are affecting each of them. 
So one of the things, for example, that would affect purity is you would have some water in there at certain points. One of the chemicals you added to remove this was the anhydrous sodium sulfate. So that acts to kind of soak up essentially the water present. And in doing that, you increase the purity by removing the water because you decanted your chemical away from the, the solid afterwards. And obviously that kept a hold of the water. So a couple of factors for how yield and purity are affected. And then we need to explain why they are relevant in the industrial context. So yield, pretty straightforward. If you're running a business, higher yield, more products to sell, more things to sell, more money. Purity. Now these chemicals can be used in things like perfumes and food flavorings and such. If you're putting this into a perfume, you can have a look through the method for the one that you've done and there was some concentrated sulfuric acid in there. You can imagine if you don't have a pure product at the end and you've still got some concentrated sulfuric acid present, squirting that on your face is not going to be pleasant. So in industry, we want a high purity because then we know what chemicals are present in our product. There's not going to be any side effects or other such consequences on our consumer. Otherwise, we will get sued and go bankrupt. Now, final thing, analyze whether boiling point measurement infrared are effective ways. So boiling point, as I've said earlier, it's kind of cheap and cheerful in terms of what it can do, give you a rough idea if things are pure or not. It's not great because it doesn't tell you what the impurities actually are if they are present. We want to know what they are because then it helps us figure out at what step in our process we need to improve in order to try and tidy up and remove these impurities. Infrared, you can do some discussion amongst that yourself with research on whether or not it's a good technique for determining purity. And then what you'll do is with these two, compare them to the methods used industrially that you'll have researched earlier down and basically saying more than likely why the industry one is better and therefore that's why it's going to be used because these are multi-billion if not multi-billion yeah I thought I said million first uh, pound companies so they are going to be investing in the best techniques to try and make sure their product is top-notch because if you've got a better yield and purity over your competitors, then you're going to be the company people are buying from. And that's it for the assignment one walkthrough. Thank you.